I'm not just writing history. I am making it. I have the brain of a historian and the clapback of a comedian. You better come with sources because I always check footnotes. Hey there, welcome back to Historians on Housewives. You're here with me, Casey. Jessica, Dr. J. Mill, the millionaires. Max Spear, the thousand air S. <laughs> <laughs> How about let's stick to sound tech extraordinaire. <laughs> sound tech extraordinaire. <laughs> so today we have a really fun episode for you with pretty much our very first fan. Uh, super fan. Super, if you yeah, will. our first super fan. Um, She's an acquisitions editor for the University of Illinois Press. Her name is Dawn Durante. And we actually have a really cool story about how Dawn became our first super fan. And so for you today, you will get a little bit of our origin story of how the Historians on Housewives came to be. Because I feel like Dawn is kind of a cool piece of this puzzle. Picture it. April 2019, <laughs> setting Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Well, before we even got to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I had asked Jessica if she'd do a Bravo thing with me more than a year ago. and An article. An article. And she goes, I'm going on sabbatical, so don't email me until March. Now, I would typically say, she said don't email until March. So, you know, 8 a.m. on March 1st. Is fair game. <laughs> and I didn't get an email at 8 a.m. on March 1st. And I thought to myself, I got to play this really cool because I don't want to scare Jessica away. And she's in Philadelphia. So I got to kind of just pump the brakes a little. So I feel like I waited until like March 18th or 20th. <laughs> and I sent Jessica an email. And I said, hey, you said to email you in March. I'd still like to talk about this housewives thing. Uh, would you happen to have some time or we can just meet up at the conference in Philadelphia the first weekend of April, the Organization of American Historians? And I did not have time. And I said, oh, but I promised. And she's been so good and has not harassed me that I feel like I need to meet with her. So I met with her, take it from there. I thought we were, again, people, I thought we were writing an article. So Jessica sits, sits down with Max and I, and, and she says, okay, so we're doing an article. And we were like, well, actually. Well, what happened was, <laughs> <laughs> I sat down and said, okay, there's some ways that you write articles, blah, 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 blah. We can do it this way, this way, and this way. And there was this tension, this uncomfortability like, what, do, do, did I dress wrong? What, what is wrong? And I said, okay, what is going on here? And that's when that, well, actually, we were thinking of doing a podcast. And I think we need to do an edited volume. And the article is good, too. But, you know, maybe some blog posts. And, you know, very multi-platform, very interdisciplinary, very much. This is going to be a lot larger than one article and it's going to take up a lot more time than that too. they had handouts people they had handouts they <laughs> pulled a dr j mill on dr j mill they played it real cool let me get it all out of my system and then they said well actually this is how we think this is going to go and by the end of the conversation the historians on housewives project existed max came with like 20 plus bullet points of themes historical themes we could be addressing in the episodes, in the edited volume. And um, so Jessica finally caved and was like, okay, I'll do this. I didn't you. even cave. Hey. I was like, it was so. <laughs> what are you talking about? It was caved. that moment. <laughs> it was like I didn't have a choice, but it was that moment where the universe said, in some ways, this is it. I mean, if anyone knows me, I've kind of been loving the, the historical profession, but at the same time, an eye on Hollywood. You know, my nickname is JMZ. People come to me first for any kind of celebrity news. And so this was like, 
they were just gifting me this this project. I said, absolutely. Don't talk to anyone else. So we get to OAH. <laughs> the Organization of American Historians. And, you know, for those of you who aren't in the historical profession, OAH is once a year. It's a super large conference uh, that a lot of people go to. So there's a lot of um, people on the exhibition floor. There's so many different panels happening at the same time. It's a really big deal. We decided we might want to go see some people on the exhibition floor and see what they thought of this project. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, podcasts usually advertise with people like Purple Mattress or Casper or something. Like maybe we should talk to university presses because they're here and we're going to be talking to people about what they work on and also Bravo. And so it seemed like it might be a good fit. So we started circulating and Casey and Max were so much fun to circulate with because if I thought I had a dog with a bone mentality, wait till you see Casey. Oh my goodness. She is a closer. She is a closer. So we went to University of Georgia Press. Uh, shout out to my press who did my book. Talked to Walter Biggins. Then we were referred to Don Durante. Had no idea. Dinah Ramey Berry said, you should talk to Don. Dinah had no idea that Don was into Housewives. We just were going to talk to University of Illinois Press. And then what happened? Don was just standing at her booth. And it was so exciting because that meant we could actually meet her. We didn't have to you know, wait until after the conference. So we went to Dawn at the University of Illinois booth. And at first I could tell she didn't really know that we were talking Bravo. And all of a sudden it was this light switch. And she was so excited to talk to us about everything related to Bravo, but also what people actually write about and scholarship of all kinds and how it would be such a great synergy. And that conversation with Dawn gave us so much energy. It it really felt like a lot of validation in talking with her. Um, and it was also, you know, kind of toward the end where the conference would be wrapping up. So it was this moment of getting to leave Philadelphia to come back to California on a real high. We're like, this can work. We can do this. And Dawn originated like our super fandom instantly. When we spoke to Dawn and it clicked that we were talking about Bravo, I kid you not, there was a tear in her eye. And she said, am I dreaming right now? No. And so from there, the relationship happened, which is how we ended up doing this podcast. So let me tell you. Today with her, sorry. Yeah, today with her. Um, so let's tell you a little bit more about Don Durante. So she is a senior acquisitions editor at the University of Illinois Press, and she's been there for eight years now. She discovered publishing as an undergraduate when she was doing an internship at the University of Arizona Press, and then she went on to do her master's in literature. She wrote a thesis on ebooks, academic publishing, and peer review, and she's earned a, scholarship, a scholarly publishing certificate from Arizona State University. Uh, she acquires books in the fields of African American studies, women, gender, and sexuality studies, American studies, religion, and she's recently added the field of anthropology to the uh, series that she's working on. So Dawn is going to talk to us today about all things university press editing, the life cycle of books, and of course we're going to talk a lot about Bravo. So with that, let's welcome Don Durante to the show. So Don, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. <laughs> So I'd like to just jump right in here and let you share with us your housewife's catchphrase. Okay. When in doubt, take a page from one of my books. <laughs> <laughs> that, was that, is good. that Okay. Was okay. Good. Oh, my God. Oh. That okay. is Sleepless good. Nights. I almost good. did a Twitter poll for it. Um, <laughs> but, uh. <laughs> Yeah, because I own a lot of books and I've acquired a lot of books, so hopefully it makes sense. Yeah. But uh, oh I, I got a lot of inspiration from Heather Debro, who was at uh, First You Don't Succeed, Try It My Way. And I kind of like the ones that tap into like a classic, like kind of cliche line. So anyway, that was it good. was great. That was great. Do you, um, by the way, because it makes me think, do you actually, do you have a favorite book that you've acquired or worked on? 
Are you allowed to um, say? I don't think I, I mean, that's, I, I don't have children, but I imagine it's like, what's, who's your favorite niece or nephew? <laughs> because I always feel like I'm an auntie of books. Um, but I actually, this is related to history. Um, uh, so next year is the uh, centennial of the 19th Amendment. So when I was thinking a few years ago about 2020 being um, the suffered centennial and it's a Berkshire conference year, the triennial conference, I really wanted to do something to commemorate it. So I was thinking about how to like maybe do something innovative. And so we're doing a compilation book of backlist content that's all been published by University of Illinois Press that's all about suffrage and the women's vote from like pre-1920 up into like even some stuff about civil rights and the voting gender cap in more contemporary aspects so it's a book I'm kind of proud of I wouldn't say it's my favorite but it's a kind of a new thing too so um yeah I love that both the idea of the book and your answer because it was very Andy Cohen. Like I can't pick a favorite housewife. I, there's just so many. Um, the other thing is that. Well, you know, it's not Ramona. It's definitely not Ramona. It's not Ramona. No. <laughs> well, and then like you bring up the Berkshire Women's Conference, and I think that this is a really important thing to explain to our listeners, like what the. Berkshire Women's Conference is, and why it's important that it's a Berks year because this only happens every three years. Right. The Berkshire Conference on Women's History only happens every three years. Um, it brings together scholars of women and gender from really across the world. I mean, we could say it's U.S. based, but people come from all over to this meeting. Interdisciplinary also, not just historians, but right, interdisciplinary. a huge swath of women scholars. Yeah, it's it's a really exciting conference to be at and it almost has this uh, like electricity that runs through it because it only happens every three years. So it's a really big deal that the Burks is falling in 2020 on the suffrage centennial. And are you, you're going to be at the Burks, right, Don? Absolutely. Um, it's really cool from an editor, like publishing perspective to go, because usually when we go to a conference and we are exhibitors, which means, you know, we have the big book display, we, we really see, like, the new titles from that year. But at a conference like Burke that only takes place at, at every three years, there's some people who, like, save their budget to go there and don't do a lot of other conference travel. So they see, like, what has happened in the last three years. And it's like, oh, wow, this is a lot of women's history and women's studies output um, from all the university presses, not just Illinois. So it's really fun to celebrate, like, three years of these books coming out and being able to highlight things like that. and. Um, Burks was one of, I think, the first women's history conference I went to as an acquisitions editor, um, uh, like six years ago, so two, two ago. So it's really fun also to think about, um, just, it's like sentimental for me, I guess is the best way to put it. Let's also, I mean, I love the Burks and I, I, and I loved your answer to that as an editor. Let's also talk, since we're on the Burks and, you know, this is apparently our day job right now, um, (laughs) Just shout out to the coordinating committee for the the 2020 conference. Martha Jones at Hopkins University is um, in charge. The, it'll be set in Baltimore. Um, notice I said Baltimore, not Baltimore. And it's just a great location to have the conference. So we just want, wanted to shout out Martha Jones and her planning committee as well. Dawn, speaking of conferences and that you get to go to conferences, can you tell us a little bit about how your career has evolved? And did you always know that you wanted to be an acquisitions editor? What does an acquisitions editor do? What are kind of the bonus perks of your job? (laughs) Um, You work on a bunch of different series, too. So I was wondering if you could tell us like the different series that you work on and maybe if there's one that's, you know, nearest and dearest to your heart. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know that I always wanted to be an acquisitions editor because I think like most people, I didn't know it was a thing. <laughs> um, I think that like as lifelong readers, even we spend our childhood reading and don't really think about what goes into making a book. And that was certainly the case for me. Um, when I was an undergraduate at University of Arizona, I was an English major and a classics minor. And I was like that. I don't think that's a job. I was getting really good at crosswords. Like I knew all the gods of all these different like ancient myths, like, you know, that are like the two or three word things. 
in crosswords, but will short seems pretty stable. So anyway, I, I was like, okay, well, how can I diversify my background? And uh, lo and behold, a job on the department with serve, an internship at University of Arizona Press posted. I applied. I got it. It was an acquisitions department. And without that internship, I say, I say this to the person who hired me and was my supervisor there, Allison Carter, who's still at U of A Press all the time. Like, my life would not be what it is if you didn't hire me. And I'm so grateful because what I learned through that internship is that acquisitions really fits my personality, which is both really happy to be like alone and quiet and independently reading, but also like socializing, talking with people. So this kind of split, um, or at least that's the way I approach my job. There's not one way people acquire every editor has like different personalities. So, um, but for how I navigate my job, it is like really freeing to have elements that are both, um, you know, it's a and Bevert kind of situation. Um, then I did a master's at Arizona State University in literature where they had a scholarly publishing certificate program. So when people ask me what my kind of scholarly background is, I'm like, actually, it's scholarly publishing. I did a thesis on peer review and ebooks and university presses. Um, and then I think that set me up, hopefully, to get the job I got at University of Illinois as an assistant about eight years ago now. So what I do now as an editor is it's a lot about relationship building um, with authors, with series editors. Um, it's a lot of me trying to um, get an idea of what are the big ideas going on in disciplines and what I see myself as a really a cultivator of those um, people who are having those ideas. So when I get submissions, whether it's proposals or manuscripts, I'm trying to think about as an editor, how can I support these ideas as a press? Are we best positioned for me to acquire that manuscript? And if not, maybe I make recommendations for other presses that can be a good home for those projects because we're as editors really invested in the scholarly ecosystem as collaborators and wanting to help those discourses grow. Um, you asked me about some of the perks of the job. I get to be a student forever. Like I learn so much. And my particular constellation of areas is African American studies, women, gender and sexuality studies, religion, American studies, and I just took on acquiring an anthropology. And I really approach those by like, okay, how can I make sure that voices at the margins are centered? And so I have a, like what I call, when we ask for authors to do a manuscript through line, I have an acquisition through line. And so the perk, the main perk is like, I'm very fulfilled by my job. And then other perks, we talked about conference travel. I get to go to cities I wouldn't necessarily have gone to before. I don't really get to see them because I'm working, but it's still fun to get a sense of place of areas I wouldn't necessarily probably travel to or think to travel to. I get to meet the smartest people at what they do, you know, and that's like, I, I could never even imagine that for myself. And I also get free books, which when I was a kid, I was like, if I just had a job where I could get free books and I'd be set, right? And so check. Um, um, and then in terms of, of series, I work on 12 and they're all very, um, they operate differently. So anyone interested in series, I always say talk to to the editor and kind of find out how they work. And series editors are really hands-on. Um, I am super excited that a series I work on is celebrating its 15th anniversary this year. It's the New Black Study series. It's an interdisciplinary series that is edited by historian Darlene clark and um, Dwight McBride at Emory. Um, one other uh, series that's interesting and doesn't work a lot like other series is a book prize contest. Um, It's a collaboration between University of Illinois Press and the National Women's Studies Association. And what's interesting about that series is people submit for the prize and they can submit their entirely unrevised dissertation to it, which is very rare that anyone's going to be able to submit an unrevised dissertation to an editor. So that prize is an annual prize um, rotating June 1st every year. And people submit partially revised dissertations, fully revised dissertations, unrevised dissertations. And that prize gives me a lot of opportunity to get a lay of a land of what people at the dissertation stage, which are like, you know, the scholarship 
that's going to be in the w- pressing wave in a few years, what is really going on in those areas. Um, in terms of more history-based series, um, the, one of the, old, the oldest series I work on is Women, Gender, and Sexuality in American History with Deborah Gray White, um, Wanda Hendricks, and Susan Kahn. And that series is celebrating its 35th anniversary in a couple years. So just like I talked about earlier, an anthology of previously published University of Illinois Press pieces, we're also going to be doing one that commemorates that volume that's really focused around the idea of women's organizing. Um, And then one of the newest series that I work on is Black Internationalism with Tisa Blaine and Keto Swan. And that series really ties to a lot of elements of my list, particularly African-American studies. so, yeah, I tried to only talk about a few of the series, but, uh, yeah, um, they're, they're really interesting to think about from an acquisitions perspective in terms of you have these major lists that are like umbrella areas, and then a series within those is a more kind of curated um, grouping within those bigger lists. So one of the things that you just mentioned, and I feel like it might be good um to give a background to our listeners is what is the actual life of a book, right? How, where, how, like, what is the timeline for these things? What does this look like to go from a dissertation to something that you're acquiring to being published? Yeah, I love this question because it gives me an opportunity to, to say um, something that I think it's really important for scholars to hear when they're in the crush of the academy Um, which is whether it's your first book and you're revising a dissertation into a book or like your fourth or fifth is that there's no one right way to do this at all. I'm sure there might be wrong ways, like don't be mean to your editor, but um, there's so many right ways to do this. So don't feel like there's only one way a proposal will look or that if your friend is going through peer review and they got their reports back on time and yours are late, that it's like some sort of signal because really just most of the reports are late. Um, so the life cycle, um, besides being really, it's a process that's different for everyone. Um, I like to emphasize that, you know, ha- like a lot of people ask me about how a relationship between an editor and an author form. And I just like to underscore that it's not really always about a book. Like we don't have to network over a book. Like the way we, like we've all networked, like it's over the housewives, right? So these relationships. Um, because editors and scholars are two different elements within the scholarly ecosystem, I think that you can feel free to approach editors about a book, but also not about a book. And you never know with three books down the line, that editor might be working on a press that's a good home for it. So it's really a lot about that relationship building aspect. And then in terms of like the formal process, like you're, you're submitting and it's a little bit like, hey, are you interested in my project? Oh, no. Or, oh, yes. And then we like take it to the next level of like, can I see your manuscript? And then maybe that goes well. And so we go exclusive, like peer review. Um, Those things can all take different amounts of time. But I like to tell people who are revising a dissertation into a book, since they often have a tenure timeline to consider, that it probably is realistic to factor in like two to five years between like that first, first contact with a proposal and when a book is coming out. And then I also like to remind people that once your book is out, like it's really, you get to like market it forever. Don't forget that element. You've worked on it for a lot of years and um, yeah, book will be out and it will always be valuable because it's been so much of your time and energy put into it and also peer reviewers and stuff like that. So um, I don't know if I, (laughs) if there's any element of that you want me to dive into a little more deeply. I'm curious, um, you know, having done the process, I don't know if I did it the right way or the wrong way, but having done the process, I know that some people have a lot more handholding or some people need more handholding. I'm just wondering, how do you balance actually producing the book with the anxiety of the authors? Yeah, um, that's one thing where my editorial philosophy is always evolving and um, I'm trying to always manage that better. One thing that this um, University of Illinois Press Suffrage Anthology compilation has really done is I, I compiled it. And so, you know, it, I had, there was, I had a lot of help from my colleagues, but I just 
this summer did proofs of a manuscript, which I had never done. So these things that are new for me that are more aligned with um, um, the author's role in all of this has helped make me an even more empathetic author. But at the end of the day, what I, I really try to do is I never want to be a one size fits all editor. I want to make sure that I am picking up on signals that people are giving me about what they need. So some authors really want to work in isolation or kind of just dip in and out in conversation with emails when it's most helpful for them. And some people really do, like you said, want some more handholding or, or need it. And so I'm just always trying to set us up for success. And that looks very different with other projects. And and by the way, I'm sure you did it the right way. I'm sure you did. Thank you. I needed it. See, when I say authors with anxiety, I'm me, I, me, I'm the author. Um, so, so let me let me ask a different question. First of all, all the series that you work on are so important to the field of of, of American history, African American history. I remember when the new blacks um, black studies series came to Illinois. That's how long I've been doing this, and um, it's been really great to see it flourish. So what I'm going to switch gears for a minute um, and ask you about actual Bravo TV. So yeah. what, <laughs> Finally. So, what can historians learn from Bravo TV? So, um, well, so for me, it's a bit of a tricky question. To answer. Like, I'm not a historian. And you so are. you just talked about having some anxiety. I'm not a trained historian. So you just talked about having a little author anxiety. So maybe I have a little editor anxiety in trying to approach this question. But I've been thinking about this a lot leading up to, you know, our conversation today. And I realized like, well, so I always call myself academic adjacent, which is exactly where I want to be. I love it. I like love that I can be part of the academy, but also be part of this publishing industry. But then I realized like, no, no, the housewives are housewives. Like a lot of the New York, there's not a single one who's really a wife. So they're housewife adjacent. So I have a ton of common <laughs> with the housewives um, in that regard. So it kind of helped me reduce my anxiety a little. I think that historians are really well poised to know what elements of their work they can connect historically with this contemporary pop culture phenomenon. Like, I mean, Veblen is like low hanging fruit, fruit with like conspicuous consumption and we were just talking a little bit about Luann earlier. It seems to be a, a beacon of that. Um, but what I really think that historians and any scholars can learn from Bravo TV, not necessarily disciplinarily, is how hard they work to promote themselves and their, um, their projects they're working on. So, you know, they're working on things like their entrepreneur, their businesses. So if, uh, not to be like reducing intellectual work to a brand, but you really are building your authority through each book, through each publication. So you want to promote that as well. So I love the way that when we watch The Real Housewives, we see them have all this agency for how they can really smartly intertwine their personalities with the, their work and like who they are. It's like really embedded. And I mean, that's probably why a lot of them are on the show if we think about it, right? It gives them a platform to talk about the things that they really care about, whether that's charity, whether that's their own business, or whether whether it's uh, kind of just their their own investment in like society and culture and whatnot. To follow up on this, one of the things that we hear all the time is what's making your work relevant. Yeah, like so great. That's wonderful information about the past. Like, why should we care? <laughs> the so what question? Yeah, the so, what, so what, question. what question? Do you find that? Thinking about reality television sometimes can help us get into that. So what? I I do think so. I think that um, I think that what I really love about a lot of more the historian projects that I acquire and work on is people are being really savvy about not only saying what does this teach, but what does this history teach us about the moment that's being studied. But also, what? How can we see connection? And not, you know, the politics right now. We see a lot of these conversations happening. So your so what question can be very embedded in the time that you're studying, and then say, how does that then impact other histories of that time? But you can also then zoom out and say, like, well, how does it also inform our understanding about the world around us today? Um, and I think that reality TV is just so, such an interesting, an interesting site. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> there's, people are going on and they're 
you hear it at the reunion specifically where they're able to like break that fourth wall and talk about experiences on the show for the Real Housewives. We're like, you weren't real enough, right? So they are really trying to expose their present realities um, in, a, in a really interesting way that maybe later people will really fold these into histories in new ways. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know. What do you all think? I feel like in part this issue of having different scales of so what is is kind of part of the inspiration for this project in the first place in, in a certain way. Um, you know, I had actually TA'd for Jessica a couple of years ago and she did this lecture that was, you know, Gilded Age and Robber Barons, but so much of her lecture was talking about Sonia Morgan of The Real Housewives mm, and, Anderson yeah. Cooper and Anderson Cooper. And students were so into it. It was this like moment where I almost feel like they would have been like, yeah, I don't care. Like I'm leaving halfway through lecture, you know, but all of a sudden there's like, yeah, like TV, there's people they recognize from the screen. And it was this weird moment where like, wait a second, we're talking about more than a hundred years ago. Why? Like, wait, you know, and so they're like putting these connections together in a way that all of a sudden did impact the way that they thought about their day to day. And it was very cool to see that um, kind of past and present meet in a certain way. Well, thank you. That was also my way to get excited about the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> now it's my favorite lecture. I have a love hate with the 19th century. I dip in, I dip out. But I, I just thought it was really ironic that we have like this tangible resonance of the robber barons right in front of us and you know and anytime I can talk about Anderson Cooper I'm like Andy Cohen like I want Anderson <laughs> to be my best friend um so thank you for that um I also think there's moments like you know I think when we, if we go back to Black Lives Matter and Phaedra actually took everyone to DC she met with the her congressperson I think there are also these moments where Bravo can be very real like these things are happening right now or the relief efforts with um, the hurricanes that hit Houston or even Puerto Rico. We've talked about uh, Bethany off and on, um, not formally on the podcast, but just amongst ourselves. So I do think there's moments that we can um, really interface with um, kind of history or history in the making. Do you yeah, have anything else? I, that The question was for you and I took over. So do you have anything no. else to add? <laughs> I just think that's a really excellent point and makes me think of um, – Carol Radzowell during the mm -hmm. election night party she had mm -hmm. and how like in what other context do we have a produced like kind of quality snapshot of not only the planning leading up to it but then like the disappointment the moments of I don't know it seems like it's it, it's a it seems really special to have that um I don't know so it's fascinating to me so you are such a Bravo connoisseur, and I was wondering <laughs> if you could elaborate on how your daily life and your career interests in Bravo meet. Yeah, I I think that it kind of seems like a really natural, uh, I guess, hobby to have watching these sorts of not just Bravo, but reality TV in general, because it's basically a lot of similarities to what I said was one of the greatest perks of my job, which is I learn a lot. And I think reality TV gives a lot of different insights into different people's lifestyles. I mean, just the sheer fact of uh, someone who would be willing to expose their life on reality television is something so different from me personally. That's interesting in itself, just baseline. Um, but I think I really got hooked on reality TV and Bravo in like its early days with the industrial shows like Top Chef, Project Runway still one of my favorites because they're experts doing something that I could never possibly do and it opens up this new thing that I knew nothing about and I don't know I, I really love that window into elements of of just reality <laughs> that I'm not really part of. And some of it's fun to watch. Some of you're like, oh, wow, you take limos everywhere. <laughs> um, and then some of it is more just like, uh, on Project One, I'll use as an example again, like it sometimes those people are living in their cars before they go on to the show and, and use it as a way to like 
expose how amazing they are at something. And I don't know, I just feel like it's a, it's a, we're, we're almost lucky to live in this age of reality television where we can be exposed to so many different kinds of people and experiences if we're open to it. Okay, true story. I watched things like Project One Runway and um, it's on BET, Sunday Best. Sunday Best is a gospel um, competition. I watch those shows in particular so I can learn how to give criticism, both the right way and the wrong way. But I am enthralled anytime people give any kind of criticism to see how it can be wrapped in, in support or it can just go to the heart of the matter. I'm a very blunt person. I'm very much more Simon Cowell, so I've had to watch <laughs> these kind of shows. So let me um, take us back to back to the history um, zone and talk a little bit about these confessionals that these women do. How do they, or do you think that they work as oral histories in a particular way? Yeah, uh, I, I think that... Um, when we first met at OAH to talk about, when you first uh, told me about historians on housewives at um, the Organization of American Historians, which, by the way, I was like, wait, can you drink too much caffeine? Am I hallucinating? This is the best news I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is so cool. Um, you had mentioned the idea of oral histories, at, these confessionals with oral histories, and I had never thought about them precisely that way, and it makes perfect sense. What I had really been thinking about these shows as is ethnography, right? Which is, sim- right, so not completely disjointed, discreet from one another. But the idea of like, especially when you look at things like ethnomusicology and you're looking at performance studies where someone's going out, interviewing, recording people and, and everyone's like, well, it's, it's probably part scripted. It's probably fake. And it's like, well, even in oral histories and ethnographies, people are still putting their best for it's not it's not always the complete picture it's the people it's the picture people want to present so I just thought this is so fascinating for people and I know it's outside the Bravo universe but I'm just waiting for like some psychologist or sociologist who's working on crying to use the bachelor and the bachelorette I mean there's so many different types of crying um (laughs) and so these things right it's like it's like sad crying happy crying really just like anyway um So I think these capture something that is very fascinating, not only about individuals, but this cultural phenomenon of reality TV has a lot to say about where we are as a culture, too. But um, in terms of the oral history elements, I do think they work as that. They talk about, it's like classic testimonies, right? It's talking about people's opinions, their families, reflecting on things, what their perspectives are. It's like truth. You know, uh, what is truth? And so I think they are um, so, and, and it's like a hallmark of reality television show everywhere, right? Like since the first season of Real World. And so I think they're really a central part of um, these shows. Okay. So it's the Bonco Party. And that is what we call our game break because of the Orange County Housewives. And you just never know what's going to happen at their Bonco parties. <laughs> so there uh, really aren't rules. <laughs> <laughs> someday, actually, someday we should learn how to actually play Bonco for the Bonco right? party, maybe. <laughs> oh, I'm just interesting you. See, I'm just, I don't know how to play Bonco. Jessica this whole time has been like, I thought we were playing Bonco, but <laughs> I am a Bonco <laughs> champion. Wait. <laughs> That is exactly, Max does a good Jessica, I might add. All these medals for nothing? (laughs) (laughs) Damn it, man. So, okay. So today we are playing a game that I've created called Plot That Drama. Okay. I was waiting for the applause, too. Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So I have taken some plots and I've tried to make them a little more generic. And so when I give you the plot, you will get one point if you know which franchise, Real Housewives franchise this is. You get one point if you can name the character that this plot is about. And you get a third point if you can name the season. So there's three questions. You and Jessica and Max are competing against each other to keep things fair. Um, We're going to have Jessica and Max actually write their answers down and lock them in so that when I go to you for your answers, they can't be swayed. Like they're already, they've already submitted. 
Um, <laughs> I will say. What she's saying is we've cheated in the past. <laughs> 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 yeah, we were on with Tanisha Ford and she was so sharp that we played a different game called Tagline Archive and she Ooh. like she instantly knew like which housewife and which franchise and which season and the two of them like their eyebrows are getting so big like oh man I we're was like, like super yeah. wrong like she must be right so I'm gonna like piggyback on that oh, yeah that sounds right <laughs> and okay. we were publicly shamed again lesson to students don't cheat yeah Tanisha totally beat them okay so yeah i'm not confident in steve that's not they didn't, they that's really not the didn't kind cheat. of smart she was I just am, really so. really she was just really great at the game they didn't actually okay. cheat but i wanted to like make sure <laughs> that the audience knew it's super fair and i will also say that i am somebody who loves giving extra credit people get so excited for extra credit and so there is extra credit today. So the game's really at a nine points, but there's two bonus points possible because two okay. of these plots have a second person. So I'm going to fail miserably is basically <laughs> <laughs> what we're setting up. Okay. So our first plot, is everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. It started with some harmless splashing, but this housewife retaliated and threw a glass of wine, cutting this housewife's lip open um i think this is real oh they are looking at me like they are super stumped so we're gonna give them like a minute to write i feel like i can tell that you're confident confident already well uh, luckily there's like eight real housewives so i didn't give it away <laughs> <laughs> Do you, if you guys are all yes yeah, stumped, yeah. I can give you the kind of wine that was probably in the uh, glass. Oh, oh yes, is that going to help? Probably no, no. <laughs> I <laughs> mean, <Maybe>. fine, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I'll, okay, I'll tell you, it was a white wine. That doesn't really help with housewives. Most no. like none of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking with my answer, even if I mean, unless you said it was a rosé, like that is not gonna help. I'm gonna us. say it was not a rosé. Yeah, then it's okay. not gonna help. So that at least narrows it down okay. a little bit. I feel like if I actually give you the name of the wine, it's gonna be so obvious. Okay, you don't have to do that. Okay, do you, are you ready? Oh, I'm totally wrong. I, <laughs> uh, I think. I, I had the franchise right. I didn't have the housewives right though. But I'm gonna lock it in. The okay. Way that it Everybody's. Is. Are you locked in, Don? Uh yeah. Okay. You wanna you wanna go first? Okay. M my guess is that it's the Real Housewives of New York. I feel like this revol involves Ramona, and for some reason, I think it was Carol that got cut. Okay. And do you want to guess on the season? Yeah, no, I have no idea. I that's just not the kind of smart I am. I have no idea about any of these seasons. <laughs> okay, uh, Max, I'm gonna say that it's Rena, Lisa Rena, in Beverly Hills when they went to Amsterdam. I think it was, and Kim said that stuff about Harry Hamlin being an alcoholic and like, <laughs> yeah, don't you ever <laughs> say that about my husband. Uh, I was wrong. You're super wrong. That's but really it, wrong. It's okay. Jessica. This is the actual answer that I've locked in on my page. I don't know, exclamation point. I thought it was Kenya and Apollo in the swimming pool, but the cut lip and the wine glass threw me. That is my actual answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So Don gets two points. <laughs> because uh, in Amsterdam, they weren't at a pool. When you started giving your so, answer, I was like, wait, I thought they said a pool. Oh, you said pool. Mm. Oh, oh. Um, Did you say pool? There, I, I, didn't say, I didn't say pool. She said it started with splashing. Harmless splashing. So this was the Real oh, Housewives okay. of New York season six, where they had to go to the Berkshires, and Ramona didn't want to go to Heather's house in the Berkshires, and they were taking the canoes out on the lake, and Ramona was yes. in a really bad mood, and Kristen um, started splashing Ramona, and Ramona got really upset with Kristen and threw her wine glass across the canoe at Kristen's face, and it cut Kristen's lip. Oh, man. Wait. Kristen threw the wine glass or Ramona? Ramona threw the wine glass and cut Kristen's lip. You know, as oh, right. who was it last night on Watch What Happens Live? And I think Andy was talking about when Ramona is is good, she's wrong. And when she's bad, she's, no, when she's right, she's bad. And when she's wrong, she's bad. Just bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I lost that round. 
Okay, this one only has the no bonus points on this next question. Okay. This housewife held a mock funeral for therapy. For therapy? Oh. Yeah, for, th- for therapy. For the I therapeutic aspect? Yeah, for a therapy session, this housewife held a mock funeral. Now we're looking for the franchise, the housewife, and the season. You ready, Don? Yeah. Okay. What What did you guess? Okay, I guess also Real Housewives of New York when Sonia holds the funeral for her dog at like Central Park or something, and I'm not confident in what season it is, but I think we just had season eleven, and I want to say this is season a few seasons ago, so I'm going to guess season eight. Okay, well, that was a good. I remember that episode. That was a good episode. Um... We really need to do an episode about Bravo and pets and death. Yes. I think that oh, there's yeah. like so much, right? And, you know, I don't know how long Mercedes left her dog in the freezer, but there is a lot to be said about the various shows mm-hmm. and the love of pets and the relationship to their humans. That's, yeah. Yeah. Max? I'm going to say that it's Real Housewives of Orange County, that it's Shannon Bador with her husband, David before they got divorced and i'm gonna say that this is season i want to say eight also okay jessica once again i failed miserably um (laughs) i don't know why i think it's kenya and real housewives of atlanta because i don't remember there being a funeral for any dog but i feel like there's something to that and i don't know the season okay so max takes this one away except it was season 10 of housewives of orange county um so season 10 of orange county opens up with shannon and david actually going to a weekend therapy retreat for him cheating on her and they actually have to stage their own mock funerals where they have to lay on the ground they actually have like a tombstone above the head and then while the one person is pretending that they're dead the other person had to like say all the things that they appreciated about their spouse that they never told them that they appreciated this is clearly the part of the season where I got tired of hearing about what said was, affair. It was, was like it a just new, the beginning. The beginning. It was like episodes, like I think it was the second episode of season 10. So Max, season eight, wrong season. But I feel like I, because you knew it was Shannon and David, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give you the bonus on oh. that too. See, I am, <laughs> I, I love giving extra credit. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I think I probably blocked that out for good reasons. Like that was kind of a weird thing, right? It was yes. super weird. Super <laughs> weird. Um and it only maybe helped them for a couple of months. <laughs> I don't even know if it helped them. <laughs> but it's so Southern California, right? Like touchy and feely totally. and let's go act this out. And yeah. I can't believe I missed this. I have to go back to the archive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was it was an intense episode. Okay, so, okay, this last plot the drama question comes from a particular franchise and season that I just, I still don't know what to do with this particular season. Um, So hopefully this rings some bells for you all. Okay, so, this housewife declared herself a Wiccan and cursed this oh, yes. housewife's husband, making him violently ill. So this does have a bonus point. If you know which housewife did the cursing and which housewife, um, you don't know have to know the name of the husband, but if you know whose husband, like the name of the woman whose husband, oh that's an extra God. point. I'm blanking on her name. I know the I'm franchise. I'm too. Max and I should pass our paper back and forth. We could <laughs> Yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> Without Casey watching. Oh man, what was her name? I'm sure like somebody who's listening to this right now is like screaming in their car. Like, <laughs> it's her. Uh do you um, do you think you have it, Don? Uh I, I'm not I'm not confident, but I have a I have pinpointed a guess. <laughs> okay. Um do you wanna not go first this time? You don't have to. Oh, I'm happy to, I'm not going to change my answer. That's, well, that's how you have to keep me honest. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, Don. <laughs> All right. My guess is, uh, this is, my guess is for Beverly Hills 
And I can't remember the woman's name, but she had a giant house. She did that weirdo party one. Like, yes. it was and then, and then it's the, I can't remember her name, but she's the one from Days of Our Lives. I think it was her husband. But oh. again, like, I'm real foggy on all this. Yeah. I mean, good guess, but Eileen was not on the same season with that particular. Episode. Okay. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Okay. So, Max. I know her name starts with a C. It does start with a C. It's Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Uh huh. I think it's season four. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. And I know she has a sex dungeon. She did. Okay. And she had a tattoo of a pentagram on her neck. Yes. That's what I remember, but I can't This is very specific. Okay, and do you remember the housewife that she had this altercation with and cursed the husband? Um, I, I'll just guess. Um, who would? Both of these housewives, by the way, were only on for one season. Oh. Hmm. Oh. That's where we're interested to my answer. Eden? No, Eden Sassoon wasn't no. married. Um, I don't think she was. Um, well, and Eden Sassoon, if you're going with season four, was definitely not a part of season four. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who it is. Okay. And Jessica? Carlisle. Was that her name close to it? Oh, that was really close. That's that not was it. Close. It's but not that's it, but that's really close. close. Something like that. Uh-huh. Uh, Beverly Hills. Uh-huh. I said three. Um... Because you just said that um, whoever was cursed was only on for a season, it takes out my answer, which would have been uh, Carlisle or whoever, whatever <laughs> the name is, cursed Kyle, well, ta- Kyle and then Maurizio. I only say that because, remember, Kyle could not handle the Wiccan aspect of this, of, of, of this character. Ooh. So I feel like I'm going to give Jessica a point because Carlisle is really close. It was Carlton. Oh. oh. I get one point. Uh, you actually get two because you got Beverly Hills. Yay, me. Uh, and Dawn gets a point for Beverly Hills. And Max, you get the two points. You got Beverly Hills in season four. So this was season four. Um, Carlton and and Joyce were having an issue. Oh, Joyce. And, and Joyce was oh, married. Right. I think he was Austrian. Yeah. And he got really, really ill. And so they were like, Carlton cursed him. And Carlton's like, yeah, yeah, I cast a spell. Right. But so like, it was like super drama. They did the Vanderpump rules crossover at yeah, that dinner. They were, yeah. They were at, they were at pump. That not I pump. Remember. They were at, yeah. Was it? No, it's no, not sir. It they were at sir. sir. Yeah. Pump wasn't open yet. They were at sir. Car- <laughs> Joyce. Okay. I remember her now. And then Brandy. Hey, was she? Go was ahead. she the Puerto Rican one with the tagline about you can never be too thin? I th- uh, yeah, she was. I think she was the Puerto Rican one that had a tagline about that. I yeah, I miss her. And her I husband like she was really a got lot. bullied out. And her husband was. I think I feel like he was Austrian. Yeah. And he was kind of larger, really heavy accent. Now he I was a character. Him. Yeah, and Brandy said a lot of uh, very racist things about her. Always. Always. Just so you know, um, Joyce's tagline was, thank you, Google. In Beverly Hills, they say you can never be too young, too thin, or too rich. That's right, Joyce. Okay, so let's tally up these points. Dawn is like an encyclopedia. (laughs) (laughs) I think we all have some tendencies here along the encyclopedia line when it comes to housewives. (laughs) Yeah, but pulling out that tagline about being too thin. I love the tagline yeah and also because she got slack at it at the reunion and i don't know if you remember this uh but she was basically like oh this is what the producers told her to say and so it was kind of the first time where i really realized like oh wait who does make these up right this um, is contrived right and then when i was trying to make up mine for this i was like where are my producers no just kidding. <laughs> i was like i need to crowdsource this so i don't get into like choices situation so the points are tallied and in third place, we have Jessica with Yay. two points. In second place, we have Don with three points. And in first, we have Max with five points. <laughs> <laughs> I got this, this whole so pan- I got a whole panel of sound effects that I've been itching to use. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. So now I want to take us back to some 
Bravo related questions and kind of let you bring in like if there's like specific episode moments you want to mention. Um, I know that there was some um, like clips you were interested in with Bethany and of course going back to the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and their sunglasses. Um, so we're going to kind of bring in some questions that allow us to kind of use the content of the shows here. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about how you're fascinated with women and on, and their entrepreneurial interests. Can you give us some examples of this? Each season seems to have more weird, like more new things. Like just on like episode two, the like second reunion episode of this New York season, Kinsley all of a sudden has an eyelash line. And so um, I think that it's really pervasive. But ones that really seem memorable, memorable to me um, are um, like Phaedra's funeral home. I mean, she's a lawyer, oh, yeah. so she like goes this new route. I mean, because she's right, it's business to that. She's like, people are always dying. And I was like, I love you, Phaedra. That's so practical. Um, and like Melissa Gorga, she starts this store. And then it's really interesting how that creates a lot of conversations between her and Joe about setting a good example for their daughter about being independent in business. And that's an interesting dynamic where she's really trying to fight like Joe wanting her to be this traditional housewife and her being like, no, I want to do this. Um, um, I think that The Apprentice, like Bethany Frankel is on The Apprentice and Skinny Girl is probably the most pervasive and most successful of all the brands that we can um, align with any of the Real Housewives. And I think that Bethany is like perfection in her marketing. Mm -hmm. I mean, she always has events throughout the season that tie back. I don't know if you guys follow her on Instagram, but her stories like this week, they're all about her like new skinny girl bra, like sports bra that she has. And she'll be like walking around outside and being like, it's so comfortable. I mean, she's committed. And, um, and then I think it's really cool how to see and notice how this has transitioned into the like offshoot Beverly Hill, like Vanderpump rules, which we were just talking about um, for a little bit ago. So you have all of those people who are not housewives who are also then using Lisa Vanderpump fame to get beyond Vanderpump rules to launch their entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial interest, you know? So Stassi has like, her new book, Basic Bitch Out, and or Basic, maybe it's just Basic, and then Kristen, <laughs> boring and slip. Um, Kristen, crazy Kristen has her T-shirt line. Like she can get her act together for that. Katie wants this big makeup initiative. Uh, the Toms are doing their own business with Lisa, Bump, Lisa Vanderpump now. So it's really interesting to me because the entire Bravo universe is like obsessed with consumption. So it was like a natural outgrowth is like the business aspect of it. It's really so entrenched in all of it. Um, I don't know. Those well, are, those, the, I mean, I could go on. Yeah. So. And there's this really interesting thing when you bring up Vanderpump Rules and now the the cast is kind of branching into their own things. Like, right. So Jackson, Brittany's Mima's beer cheese, right? Beer cheese, but, yes. but like Jax is like, we don't need Lisa Vanderpump to market our beer cheese. We don't need it in Sir or any of those restaurants. Like we can do it ourselves, right? And so it's this really interesting way in which everyone's finding out about Mima's beer cheese because of the show, right? They're actually having the cast over to taste the beer cheese and they're like, I've never even heard of beer cheese. What is this? <laughs> you know? And, oh, uh, it's so good. You should try it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I haven't like, had, had Jackson Brittany's, yeah, but <laughs> I've had beer cheese before. Oh, oh okay. but like, um, actually, I don't know if I've actually had it in California or if I've just had it when I'm researching in the Midwest. But, um, but yeah, it was just like this moment where you get these people who really aren't even all from California. Like they've ended up in California from other places. So you would have thought that they would have encountered beer cheese at some point along the way. There's a disproportionate number of the Vanderpump Rules kids who are uh, the pumpers who are uh, all from Florida. Like Florida seems to be the hub where Vanderpump gets her. Yeah, Jax is from Florida. Ariana's from Florida. Um, is Sandoval also from Florida? No, he's from St. Louis. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So he should have had beer cheese. I feel like Sandoval should have had beer cheese before me. I don't know. He doesn't look like he enjoys food. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, he never can be too thin. Yeah. 
Yeah, he looks like he doesn't like to look uncomfortable. Like he's constantly trying to look put together. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and also with like singing careers, like Sheena has a singing career, tries to mm-hmm. have a singing career. Lala seems to be doing it more successfully. DJ James Kennedy. I mean, even in terms of singing careers, Countess Luann's uh-huh. singing career has really, really grown and changed. I feel like Bravo is just playing um, Roni season three, which I still think is the best. It's like Kelly Ben Simone's. I think it's her last season. Mm-hmm. It's when they go and it's like the scary island and Jill. Z- it's Jill Zarin's last season and it's all that drama because Bethany's getting engaged and she's pregnant and... Ramona's being super crazy on the Brooklyn Bridge, and it's just such an intense season. But um, I feel like that's when Countess Luann came out with um, one of it was that Money, Money Can't Buy You class. Yeah. yeah. And so now we're in season eleven. She's becoming this large cabaret star, but it really took her a while to really break in to that in the way that she's created it for herself now. I also think that she started as like a club act and has slowly evolved to a cabaret act. And it's interesting how she has made that pivot and that that slight but seemingly crucial distinction about like her brand. Well, and somewhere in there, I feel like they go to karaoke with Heather and and Countess Luann is like taking her karaoke bar appearance very seriously now wait for it because these two haven't watched the last reunion right done <laughs> just spoil it for them yeah spoil, spoil it, it we them. don't care oh i've already read the articles like they're telling her she's no adele N- yeah she's no adele she's not good but don what what happened reenact it for us well they're also very uh outspoken that she's been using her sobriety as a launching pad for that element of her career and like stopping up fame from like being in the headlines so, you know, I do admit, like, Luann put in a lot of work over the years and also seems to have been able to ca- capitalize on this. Uh, like, whether it was good news or bad news in the news, she would have capitalized on it. But, like, Bethany especially was, like, very, like, well, you know, you cashed in on your sobriety. Right. So then Luann said, um, I just got cast in Chicago, so you can all go straight to hell. <laughs> Did and you I was, really? Yes. Mm-hmm. You missed it last night. You oh took the night off. It was so hot in our house. I couldn't. I just wanted to say, while well, we're talking about entrepreneurial, that now we have an <laughs> ending for Aunt Luann. Well, she hasn't gotten the reviews yet for Chicago. But <laughs> so let's not talk too soon. But that would be good. This is just like for a future show idea to talk about like musical theater and the housewives. Now we could do that. Yeah. I mean, there's so many of them that have they think is like a musical career. Don't be tardy for the party. Ooh. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and Kim Zolciak <laughs> tried a second single in her last season of um, her own show, but her new single just did not. Did what not. was it? Google me or. Yeah. Google me. Da, na, na, really? Da, that's what it was? I yeah. don't even remember. It was that and unmemorable for me Google. as the, as the second single, but. Clearly, Candy Burris did not work on the second Meanwhile, song. Meanwhile, Candy and Escape has, have reunited. They've had a show. They've gone on tour. Candy's decided not to go on tour. I mean, meanwhile, the real singers are out doing the work that they need to do. Um, and then there's Luann. And then there's Luann. <laughs> so that was a yeah, lot but of entrepreneurship. Can we, <laughs> can we also mention Erica Jane here? Because I think she's fabulous. Yeah, <laughs> She also, like, working it crushing it um but you know you, i i think that that's a cool idea the music uh housewives and musical careers because you know melissa gorga has also dabbled mm-hmm. and um and i don't know but, but all Eric of Jane, slade's I, I love her so much <laughs> yes all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and i mean erica jane had this really excellent she was like such a professional in this moment in this last season of Beverly Hills where she's having her big show and at the theater, one side of the stage just like cut sound. Right. So, and like, but she doesn't really let it disturb any of it. Right. So by the time they get the sound fixed and everything's come back up, like everybody is right in step. They haven't actually dropped or missed a beat. Which was, I was just so impressed because you can tell that she takes her music career really seriously. Well, I think she had a career before she became a housewife, which also distinguishes her 
from, I mean, even Bethany to a certain extent, in which, like, I think pretty much, and Candy also had a career and in Rena. music. And who? Oh, not in music. Sorry, not in music. <laughs> I was saying Ren and Lisa Ren. Oh, yeah. Days yeah. of our lives. But that Housewives didn't necessarily make their career possible. Right. In other words, um, I'm still looking for Ramona Pinot Grigio. I have not been able to order it. As, <laughs> er, as most recently as last week, I was on a website trying to get a hold of some Ramona Pinot Grigio. And Listen, I can't. Listen, we still can't get Sonia's toaster oven. I know. True. But, <laughs> but her clothing line is out and people are wearing it. And her clothes actually look nice on people. Does it have the family crest on it? The oh, shoes, the shoes do those shoes that were part of the controvert. Like when Dorinda got mad about um, the, the shoes divorced having husband the versus seal, the deceased husband. Yeah, and having that seal on the shoe, and you shouldn't have their imprimatur or whatever because you're not a Morgan. Like that was actually her shoes that I think she's selling now, and oh, she wow. has all kinds of styles. They look very cute. If I wore women's shoes, I would. So, well, do you watch Shaws of Sunset? Mike, Mike has a, a shoe line, or he did. Right. For a while. Shoe line, I think right. this dude was also in Kitson, which we just had a show. Was it? It was Beverly Hills, and yes, someone Dorit. just oh, uh, Dorit. Dorit just did her Beverly Beach display, and so I was like, "We've seen a store. He, we've seen this store before. <laughs> Nothing gets by me." <laughs> <laughs> you had mentioned before the show that the real housewives have created what you call an apology economy. And so I was wondering if you could talk to us about what an apology economy is and how this can help us think about all of these things that we've been talking about. Um, so I don't know if maybe starting at, you know, that clip with the real housewives of Beverly Hills and the discussion about the really expensive sunglasses is like, a way to start or where do you want to take this? Yeah. So this apology economy is something that I probably, as I was like, you know, playing a drinking game during a reunion kind of thought up, but then over time I'm like, I think, I think this is actually a really interesting way to think about what is going on amidst the relationships between these women. And basically the, the nugget of it is, is that when you have immense wealth and material goods, and so these women do, and we can think of the example you were saying, with Dana and her $25,000 sunglasses. Mm -hmm. um, I also think of like Danielle Staub, just newly um, on these like kind of newer seasons in New Jersey again on her wedding registry has like these Versace plates and like all of this really high expensive stuff um and it's no problem for people to buy those things right so mm -hmm. then how do you gauge like if, if i mean if you're really in a materially embedded existence and you someone can buy you a present when for your birthday or uh, like if they do something wrong um it's almost like money becomes meaningless <laughs> and so it's like these apologies have so much weight for them because it's like their alternate economy in a way. And I'm not saying this is the overall encapsulating thing of the show because I think consumerism is, um, but definitely you see this playing out in reunions, which are a culmination of the, each season and are kind of like, they like, I've been looking at them like an apology marketplace. <laughs> um, they're like, and then even through seasons, you see things come up where basically Lisa Vanderpump left the show because Dorit and Kyle weren't contrite enough. Like they weren't like, oh, taking it back and apologizing. I mean, she left the show um, because she says it's like her reputation. But at the end of the day, she was also like, you never apologize and things like this. Um and I also started thinking about this a long time ago because Bethany started calling, I think it was Bethany, and it was the whole group started calling Ramona the apologizer. And so for me, mm -hmm. I was like, they're, they're like literally labeling a phenomenon that's going on here and trying to kind of like process what's going on. So of course, there's always like accountability being called out, like Ramona is never changing. She's just always apologizing. 
But every time she apologizes, especially to Bethany, who she's horrible to, Bethany is like, oh, okay, thank you for that apology. That was really nice of you. Like, it's, it's really still impactful. There's a currency there with them, no matter how times they're apologizing. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the, um, the interesting, one, one thing I think of a lot when I'm thinking through, like, just these um, behavioral exchanges is, I don't know if you remember in Beverly Hills, where um, Lisa Rinna and Kim had this falling out. And then Kim is having like her first grandbaby. So Lisa Rinna offers her, her an apology by virtue of shit giving her this like stuffed rabbit. They are and the then, blue bunny. Exactly. And then we go to the, uh, the reunion, which like if we can imagine it again as our apology marketplace. Kim does not accept her apology. She literally returns the material object because, again, in this, like, economy, material objects aren't really what they care about because Kim doesn't feel it was a genuine apology. And so this affects Lisa Rinna. We see it playing out in just this most current season. And so I just think there's, like, I don't know. Maybe all you scholars can help me put better words to this. But there's just, like, this fascinating dynamic that's going on here. And I think you see it playing out across all the franchises where I've never seen my friends or any group of humans be so focused on like getting an apology for something. So I don't know. I don't know. What do you, what do you, if you have any thoughts? I mean, the other part of the bunny too, is that Kim said something to the effect of like, it didn't have good energy, which to me sounded, sounds like not only are we, are they existing within an apology economy, but they're also, attaching spiritual significance to these apologies like the bunny itself is in tainted. Some, is tainted in some way and can bring misfortune to my life by keeping it in my house or by throwing it away like i have to give it to you on this show and to make a presentation of it right because like the apology needs to happen again still yeah so, yeah so and i and i wonder to the extent to which this apology economy, as you're calling it, is operating as a means of um, bringing people back into some sort of balance within the group dynamic, right? That like you have a season full of, um, you know, a lot of injustices going in all sorts of directions, but the act of the reunion and the apology is like, um, until I've received my apology, um, you are still um, um, damaging my image, right? The act of you apologizing to me um, almost like recuperates the image that I am trying to maintain. Well, I think that, you know, there is this culture just in general. People do not apologize. They just do not apologize. They can't humble themselves. Um, they will say, um, I'm sorry when they're really not. But to actually verbalize, I apologize takes a level of humility that I just, we don't see in, the, in, in society or in some of these franchises. And, of course, we know people apologize on, at the reunion, and it doesn't really, really matter. They apologize, they hug, and the next season they're fighting again. So I guess what is the social cachet of apologizing? It's like they just want it. Like it's like an immediate gratification. It's like a materialistic replacement process transactional. And like, right, it doesn't mean it. Like everyone's apologizing. Leanne on Real Housewives of Dallas is like horrible to people every season. Brandy, like they apologize, they get over it. But um, yeah, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's, I kind of, I guess, had a little bit of opposite take on like that need for apologizing because it's so, it's such a feminized thing in culture. Like women are expected to apologize more than men. So it almost seems like they're taking on that thing of like holding it to each other to a higher standard. And I don't know that they're actually sometimes being asked to apologize for things that they owe an apology for. I think sometimes it's just kind of a substitute kind of um, like a, a proxy way to handle it, maybe like as Casey said, to kind of resettle a group dynamic. But we all watch it for the drama. So I don't really, I'm not so invested in them having like a status quo. It's great when they all get along. Right. But, and, I, um, and I feel like it's only meant to be temporary band-aids, right? Because I think that there is also an element where like, I really don't think Ramona likes Bethany or that they would ever actually not have a lot of drama. But I think that like, 
in these settings, right, where a dinner party or a party in general is is really held to have a fight, right, and to have a breaking up of the community, right? The apology serves to, like, kind of knit it back together so you can get to another party and another moment where you can have drama and explosion, right? But that, like, all of these people are carrying kind of that elephant memory with them, right, where each time the explosion is actually worse because they're like, and you did this and this and this and this, and you apologize, but you didn't mean the apology, so mean the apology this time. Mm-hmm. But I really, I really like this concept of an apology economy. Mm-hmm. Well, good, because I've never really talked about it before. So this is a good, like, litmus test. <laughs> it's, 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 it's great. It's intriguing. We'll see when we release it, what people uh, How people want to weigh in. Yeah. yeah. It'll be cool. Yeah. Um, switching gears slightly, um, talk to us a little bit about your Bravo celebrities, your favorite ones. Um, how do you pick your favorites? We know that you like Captain Sandy, but um, how did Captain Lee not make your list? Because I only had three spots. Uh, <laughs> I had to pick my top three. No, um, I think Below Deck and, um, and Below Deck Mediterranean, which we, we haven't talked about yet, are, are those kind of more the industrial side ones. Like the other pump rules is a little bit like that because it's like, you know, these got, people are all working at the bar. Um, but I think San- Captain Sandy is like a kind of not like almost anything we've seen on the network before in a way. Because she's in such a, may, may, I'm sure I'm wrong. I'm sure there are others. But of the shows I watch, I can't really think of a tr- where someone is so clearly in a usually male dominated role and is the leader in the kitchen. And like, it's really not like this, the crew don't push back on her for being a woman. Whereas you see in Top Chef, like the women, you know, that's a male dominated kitchen era usually. And like the women, you see that playing out in the number of winners they've had that are women and stuff like that. So Captain Sandy is still kind of new. She's very shy. Like, I, I'm very interested in her. I think I like her because I haven't quite figured her out yet. Like, not that there's something to figure out, but I think that she's changed a little bit um, between the seasons or just, like, adjusted. She calls this out at the beginning of the second season where she's, like, before I said, call me Sandy. Not anymore. Like, so I really like I, I like her a lot. I love Captain Lee. I think I respect him a lot. Um I was like, maybe in another life I would have gone to work on a boat. I don't know. I really like the show. Um, well, my there's other an element problem- of Sandy okay. where she's always dealing with sexism. Like, even though the crew comes to respect her, there's always that awkward beat at the start of every season with Sandy where the men on board, like, just don't really seem to have a concept that she is their captain. Right. And so she has to always like kind of reset and redraw boundaries. She gets guests on board that are like, oh, you're the captain. Right. And so and it's interesting how she's constantly navigating these issues, Mm -hmm. but still um, really um, people respect her and she's a great captain. And it seems like she's probably also not a bad person to work for. Like she actually schedules like fun time for her crew that she calls training where she's like yeah go on the water slides like do what the guests would do you know and so I feel like she's like Captain Sandy is in part so fascinating exactly like you said because she's this woman in a role that people think of as so man centered I mean we saw that most recently with uh Travis I think his name is yeah. when he referred to her as Sandy and it's that sort of like I don't have to be professional around you because you're a female in power and so I'm going to just assume that like we're on a buddy buddy basis. Um and she corrected that and what I find very interesting about Sandy is that she doesn't when she does these corrections or when she says to guests like no I am the captain that her immediate response is always to um, push the, like, sexist elephant in the room to the side. Like, to always say, like, I'm not even paying attention to that. Like, it doesn't matter. Yet she is constantly confronted with it. Yeah. And that is a really interesting dynamic in a space where, like, she, like it's on her like she like without captain sandy like theoretically like the boat would sink you know like they're in the middle of the mediterranean what are they gonna what are they gonna do without her and yet at the same time she also has to like play in these like micro battles of like 
no, I, I'm a female cat. Like I'm a captain. I've done this for decades. I think she was on a ship that was uh, attacked by pirates. I yeah, think I feel like she. Or was yeah. that Captain Lee? I think that was Sandy. That was oh. Sandy. She has the ability, I think, to make more of a stand about that and doesn't, which I find also a fascinating character study. So maybe she's just our post-feminist figure. She is the walking embodiment of (laughs) post-feminism. I have to say one of my favorite scenes with Captain Sandy was in last season, Below Deck Ned, when she was irate with Hannah for being on the boat with guests and, and was just like, go to your room and I don't want to see you. And like, she was enraged, but it was like, just such a, she didn't, wasn't like screaming her head off or anything, but it was like, but it was such, it was so powerful. And I don't know. I'll just always remember that about Captain Sandy. Yeah. That was, that was an intense moment. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. It was, it was, it really was. It was good TV. It was great TV. Yeah. <laughs> it was. So what about your other Bravo liberties? Yeah, I think I probably, uh, this will be obvious. To, since I've brought her up so many times, but Bethany Frankel, I think, is the realist of them all. I think she leaves so much out on the table. I think she is so quick-witted. Um, no, none of the housewives are perfect, we know, um, but I think she's pretty close. I, I just really admire her, and I like loved how she shone a light on Puerto Rico and all the charities she does, and um, I don't know. I think she is really fascinating and she has showed such an interesting professional evolution over the course of like building her brand. I mean, what, like how, how else before these shows would we ever have like such a clear glimpse into how business works um, and how different people can do startups just on a daily basis, uh, you know, not at the level of skinny girl, of course, but I don't know. I just think she's fascinating. And then I think um, Andy Cohen is a, is a genius, right? So the story of how he couldn't break into like some traditional network television as a journalist because like he had a lazy eye. Is that the story? Oh, I've never heard of that. That's what you, this is what I've heard. So like, then he <laughs> marks his own way. And I don't know. I just really, um, it's fascinating to me how well brand, branded Bravo is. Like every show on that network makes sense in a constellation and I don't think you could say you can't say that all tv channels um especially ones that have um are producing as many new shows as Bravo is um but no I have a lot of brought like Tim Gunn was really close to making that list um I like a lot of the other housewives and fascinated by them I love anyone who's been a reality tv like crossover like Cameron was on Real World and now she's on Southern Charm mm-hmm. and Eva from America's Next Top Model what like cycle three, I want to say, now on Atlanta. I mean, that is like my, my, I'm fascinated by that. Stassi, so, Stassi um, was on Amazing Race when she was 16 before she uh, had her chin implant. I didn't even know that. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's it, So her father put her family up to doing Amazing Race. I haven't seen their episodes, um, but I have seen photos of it. And Stassi, from what I've seen, has, like, gothic jet black hair and, like, just the biggest moody face. Like, I can't believe I'm 16 and I'm on this road trip with my father and my mother. I think her mother was there. God, I hope her mother well, that's was there. fascinating. I also watch Amazing Race, and I don't know if any of you watched this last season, but it was all couples from other reality shows. So it was Amazing wow. Race teams, Big Brother teams, and Survivor teams. So I think that's all the CBS universe. But like, this was just this is kind of the same thing, bro. Right? It's like it folds in on itself in its own universe, right? And so. Like what? Watch what happens. Lo- what happens live is a good example of how like you're basically using your own universe and then just like re reifying <laughs> the fame of these people by making them more famous by giving them more exposure. I just love it. I love it all. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, tell us what's next for you. What are you working on, and how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? One thing I'm really uh, when we're talking about some of. Um, 
kind of charting new ground in terms of um, building new things. One of the things um, we're building here at the press is um, a, a fun. I don't know if, if people know this, but authors, we often ask them to get subventions to help support the nonprofit publishing that all we do. And I'm, I'm doing, there's a fund we started in the name of Darlene Clark Hine, who I had mentioned is one of the co-editors of the New Black Studies series. So the Darlene Clark Hine African American History Fund here at University of Illinois Press. So I'm dabbling in development, um, trying to think about, okay, you know, there's all these housewives and they're asking people for money. How do they do it for their charities kind of thing? So that's one new thing. Um, I am always trying to balance, um, amongst all of the different series and lists that I'm working on. Um, I had mentioned earlier that I'm working on a, a kind of UIP anthology for women, gender, and sexuality in American history series. Um, but I'm always looking for new projects. I'm really interested in projects that um, drive the field that you're working in forward, that shed light on new voices, new experiences, especially ones that take voices and experiences from the margins and try to center them or examine why they're at the margins. And people can get in touch with me by email at the press or I'm on Twitter at Dawn D. Um, but yeah, I'm mostly excited to hear what everyone else is working on because as an acquisitions editor, that's way more interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. This thank was you, so Dawn. fun. Thank you. We look forward to your next appearance on the Historians on Housewives podcast. Mm -hmm. Me too. And you don't know it, but all this time I've been wearing my sparkly gown reunion dress. <laughs> you're beautiful. Wonderful. I like that you're on brand. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. Great. All right. Thanks again for this opportunity. This is so cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We had a great time. Have a great weekend. You too. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. As always, you can find us at historiansonhousewives.com, where you too can propose an episode topic, a blog post, um, a journal article, or ask us questions or send us feedback about the shows. You can also follow us on Twitter at historiansh. And remember, we live tweet our Bravo shows Sunday through Thursday, so you can always interact with us on the Twitter too. We want to thank John Durante for being our special guest today. This show was brought to you with the support by Barbara and Mark Spear, Saddleback Community College, Christina Hinkle, Christina Gambapore, Jed Merlaski, Pete Murray, Cody Baker, Molly Callahan, Dr. Joaquin Galarza, Courtney Crow, and Lara Loper. And remember, scholars do bravo too. Someone told me to eat apples, but I forgot to eat an apple. Oh, shit. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Like...